Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, New York Giants Preservation Society meeting for today, December 5th, 2024. We have John Iamarino going to be talking about his great book called uh, Seven Games in 62. The Yankees and Giants square off in a classic World Series. Uh, Twofold reason for this, we have so many San Franciscans in the audience, many of you who saw the game, and just I, I believe there's at least a dozen uh, coaches, managers, and players who played for the New York Giants who are involved in this uh, famous World Series that you all know how, unfortunately, it ended. A um, couple of other announcements. Next week, we'll have Jerry Eisenberg, Again? legendary journalist who will be discussing his new book on uh, Larry Dolby. And then we have Richard uh, Quickie, uh, two weeks from today. He'll be talking about uh, the first game that all three Aloos played together and the Aloos uh, with the Giants. So we have, a you know... Another way in is Felipe Alou was drafted by the New York Giants, so it's it's all good stuff. So anyway, uh, I would like to all welcome John Iamarino to the New York Giants preservation tonight. John, thank you so much. Give it up to John. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Glad thank you, to John. be here. Uh, good evening to everybody. I'll tell you right off the bat, I'm glad I'm not following Jerry Eisenberg because I've read his stuff for years and years, and I know he's a great writer, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy next week's presentation. What you know, as baseball fans, we all have a year that we can look back on when we really became involved in the game and really started following it. And for me, it was 1962. I started watching the the games on TV and the Yankees on WPIX, the Mets on WOR, out of the polo grounds, of course. Um, I remember games from that year, and uh, I certainly have memories of that World Series, and it's the first one I have memories of. And as the years have gone by, I've often wondered, why doesn't that World Series get more attention? Because if that uh, event had taken place today, it would be filled with um, social media commenting on the manager's decisions and the controversies that came up and the everything that happened in there. So that was one element that I said, you know, I, maybe I'll be the one to, to put this into some detail. And the, the other one was comparing what the game was like in 1962 versus what it's like today. And of course, it's quite drastic, even without the golden at bat. Um, so in the book, mm -hmm. I started off talking mm -hmm. about the pennant races and, and in the American League. So that's where I'll begin. And I'm looking forward to the, the question and answer session that we're going to have later. Um, in terms of the pennant race, the Yankees didn't really have much of a pennant race. On the 4th of July that year, the Los Angeles Angels of all teams were in first place. That was a team that had uh, just been formed in 1961. So they were in their second year. Uh, they had people like uh, Jim Fregosi and Leon Wagner and uh, Dean Chance and uh, Bo Belinsky, who threw a no-hitter against Baltimore earlier that year in 62. But the Yankees took first place in July 8th. They never had a lead less than two games, you know, after that. Um, Mickey Mantle missed a month with a, a severe muscle tear in May. But he still wound up being the most valuable player. He hit 30 homers and drove in 89 runs in limited play. Uh, Roger Maris hit 33 home runs a year after hitting 61. Uh, Tom Tresh was the rookie of the year in the American League in 62. He replaced Tony Kubek at shortstop while Kubek had a commitment to the Army, the National Guard, and uh, Tresh hit 20 homers, drove in 93 runs uh, to earn MVP. When Kubek came back in August, they moved Tresh from shortstop to left field, and that's where he played in the World Series. In the National League, the Dodgers moved into first place on that same date I mentioned earlier, July 8th, and they were in first place all the way up until the playoff. 
but they went 13 and 14 in September. Now the Giants were 16 and 12. They, they didn't exactly tear it up, but they did win seven of their last 11 games to catch the Dodgers. On the last day of the season, uh, I'm sure many of you have memories of this. It was a Sunday afternoon. The Dodgers lost their third straight to the St. Louis Cardinals on an eighth inning home run by Gene Oliver. Gene Oliver. Gene Oliver. And uh, the Cardinals won that game one to nothing. Meanwhile, in San Francisco, the, uh, the Giants and the Colt 45s, as they were known then, were tied 1-1 going into the bottom of the eighth when Willie Mays homered off Dick Farrell to win the game 2-1, to one, sending the uh, pennant race into the playoff. So the playoff began the very next day, um, October 1st. The Dodgers, I believe, won the coin toss and chose to play the first game in San Francisco and then the next two, if necessary, in L.A., the Giants threw Billy Pierce in the opener. He was undefeated and would remain undefeated all year at Candlestick. And um, he went, he beat the Dodgers eight to nothing. Mays went three for three, drove in three runs, and scored three. Game two, the Giants had a five nothing lead in the sixth inning. And at this point, the Dodgers had gone 35 consecutive innings without scoring a run, 35 consecutive innings. But in the bottom of the sixth, they rallied for seven runs to take a seven to five lead. Jack Sanford had started for the Giants. Um, he ran into some early trouble with wildness. Dark pulled him, Alvin Dark was the manager, of course. Um, and the giant bullpen did not do a very good job. The Giants eventually tied the game at seven seven, but in the bottom of the ninth, Four giant pitchers issued three walks, and eventually Ron Fairley hit a sacrifice fly to center, uh, scoring Maury Wills with the winning run to tie the playoff series at 1-1. The third game was played on Wednesday, October 3rd, very famous date, obviously, in New York Giant history. Eleven years to the day, um, the Giants overcame a 4-2 lead in the ninth inning, um, not, not quite the dramatics of the Bobby Thompson home run. Uh, in this ninth inning, they used four walks, an infield single by Mays, one single that went to the outfield, uh, and an error by the Dodgers' second baseman. And they scored four runs and wound up winning the game 6-4 to four when Dark called on Billy Pierce to pitch the ninth inning, uh, not relying on his bullpen. So the Giants captured the, the playoff. The next day, they had to start the 1962 World Series. I've read in the sporting news and doing some research for my book, uh, you know, an editorial by the sporting news that said this was grossly unfair to the National League winner to, to have to win the, you know, go three games, win it, and then have to play the very next afternoon. But that's what happened to the Giants. They had to go right to it the very next day. Um, because of the playoff, you had, you had much less uh, pre-series coverage among the media about uh, you know, comparing the teams and all of that. The, the one thread that probably went through any preview articles in advance of game one of the series was the old adage, you know, does a team that's been playing and winning have an advantage over a team that's been rested, hasn't really had to be competitive for a while. The Yankees had clinched the pennant fairly early, didn't have a meaningful game really up until this one for in about 10 days uh, versus the Giants who had to play the very next day. So game one was the rested Yankees versus the tired Giants, I guess. Whitey Ford versus Billy O'Dell, who had won 19 games for the Giants that year. In the first inning, the Yankees take a 2-0 lead when Maris hits a fly ball to right field, right center, and Felipe Alou goes up. If you, if you ever look at the um, official World Series film, it's clear. The ball is in his glove. He hits the wall at Candlestick. 
The ball pops out, uh, and two Yankee runs score. So the Yanks led 2-0 in the first inning. The Giants uh, eventually tied it uh, in the third on a single by Mays. They had scored a run earlier uh, that snapped uh, Ford's uh, consecutive inning streak that uh, he had going uh, for several years from 1960 through 62. He had beaten Babe Ruth's record. Some of you, I'm sure, are aware of that. So the game is 2-2 two to two in the seventh. When Cleet Boyer steps in for the Yankees against Odell, and uh, Boyer, interesting note, his first World Series was 1960. He had opened his career with the Kansas City Athletics, uh, as happened a lot in the 50s. The, the A's and the Yankees made several trades. Boyer wound up a Yankee. He's in his first World Series in 1960. He's the opening game third baseman. Uh, the Yanks get a run in the first inning against Pittsburgh, but the Pirates score three in the bottom of the first. So Boyer is scheduled to bat with two men on base in the top of the second inning of game one. And Casey Stengel sent up a Dale Long, the left-hand hitting power first baseman, to pinch hit for Boyer. Boyer later was quoted, I, I won't use the language he used, but he was no longer a Casey Stengel fan after that was probably... Very happy that Stengel got fired after that World Series. So Boyer had been burning about this, you know, for a couple of years. So he comes up in the seventh and he drills a long fly ball to left field, thinking it's going to bang off the wall. Well, the, 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 the ball clears the fence, a home run. The Yanks take a 3-2 lead. Uh, they wind up adding on in the eighth and ninth inning. Ford goes all the way. The Yankees win it 6-2 to two in game one. The second game is uh, a matchup that we'll see a lot of in this series. Ralph Terry for the Yankees, who had won 23 games during the regular season. Jack Sanford for the Giants, who had won 24. Um, but it's, it's Sanford all the way in this game. He throws a brilliant three-hit shutout. The Giants win it. Two to nothing in two hours and 11 minutes game. Um, Alvin Dark never warmed up a reliever the whole game. Uh, Terry takes the ball. Um, Matty Alou uh, drove in a run with a ground out in the first inning. And then Willie McCovey, I heard you talking about him. He hit a long home run in the seventh inning, and, and that was the scoring. So the Giants now are getting ready to go to New York. They're, they're going to finally have a day off for the first time in quite a while, um, in a week. And they're feeling better about themselves. They're 1-1. Um, so game three is back in Yankee Stadium where they have an, an enormous crowd, of course. But uh, the interesting thing, and again, if you watch World Series films from the 50s and early 60s, in Yankee Stadium, it is amazing how many fans are rooting for the opposite team. And it's because so many people from other parts of the country wind up living in New York. And in this case, of course, the Giants had only been gone five years. There were a ton of New York Giant fans that bought tickets for the series or when the Giants won the playoff, arranged to buy tickets and, and showed up <clears throat> for games three, four and five. But game three is Billy Pierce against um, Bill Stafford, a right-hander, young right-hander for the Yankees. Uh, the game is scoreless through six and a half innings. Um, in the seventh, key play occurs, and um, what, some of the writers hung this on Alvin Dark, but Dark had decided to put Felipe Alou, who normally played right field at home, he put him in left field because left field, as some of you know, for Yankee Stadium in October is the sun field, was the sun field. He put a Lou there and moved McCovey to right field. They wanted McCovey's bat in the lineup against Stafford, um, but they put Felipe Alou in left field. So in the seventh, Tresh leads off with a single. Mantle gets a single to left, and the ball bounces up and hits full Alou. He said he lost it in the sun. They give him an error. Mantle goes to second base. So you've got runners on second and third. Um, and then P 
Pierce tries not to give Roger Maris too good a ball to hit <clears throat> first base open, but he makes a pitch out over the place plate. Maris uh, lines it into right field. Um, two runs score. McCovey bobbles the ball, another error by the Giants. Uh, Maris goes to second base. This turns out to be a key play because uh, the game is 2 nothing right now, but Maris is on second instead of first. Elston Howard hits a long fly ball to center field. Mays catches it, but Maris tags up, moves to third. And then uh, Cleet Boyer hits a ground ball, should be a double play ball to Jose Pagan at shortstop. He throws to second, but the second baseman, Chuck Hiller, uh, whose nickname, I'm not making this up, but his nickname was Iron Hands. He was not known as a good defensive second baseman. But he struggles to get the ball out of his glove by the time he throws to first. Boyer, who is not a fast runner, beats the rap. Maris scores from third, and so now it's 3 nothing. In the eighth, Stafford takes a, a line shot off his left shin from Felipe Alou. Uh, he recovers the ball, throws Alou out, but they have to kind of revive him on the mound. How comes out? He later jokes and says, you know, I saw no blood on the mound, so he was going to stay in. I mean, completely different game than it is today. Um, Stafford gets out of the eighth inning, but he comes out in the ninth. Uh, they had put ethyl chloride or whatever they used back then on his leg. Uh, they had to give him smelling salts in the dugout because he felt like he might faint. Um, you, you can't, a 3 nothing lead, you can't imagine a manager today sending the starting pitcher out. But Stafford went out there and um, gave up a double to Mays with one out. Um, and then Ed Bailey, who was the catcher, uh, hits a two-run homer into the short porch in Yankee Stadium in right field. So now it's 3-2. Houck still insists that he's going to keep Stafford in there, and he uh, ends the ball game by getting Davin Jim Davenport to hit a fly ball to Death Valley out in left center field in Yankee Stadium. So the Yankees win that game 3-2. They now lead the series 2-1. The next game, game four, is, is Monday, October 8th. This is what, what Giant fans think of as the Haller-Hiller game. Um, Juan Marichal starts against Whitey Ford, pair of Hall of Famers going against each other. In the second inning, Haller hits a two-run homer to give the Giants a 2-0 lead. A couple of interesting things about Haller. Uh, he was a quite an, a uh, skilled quarterback in the Big Ten. He was he was an all honorable mention All-American as a quarterback at Illinois in 1957. And the Giants, Carl Hubble, was one of the scouts that looked at him and liked the fact that he had been a quarterback in college. He had leadership skills uh, that impressed them. Uh, the Giants paired Haller and Ed Bailey, who I mentioned earlier, as their two catchers in 1962. Both were left-hand hitters with power, uh, but they made the, the platoon work. Haller hit slightly better, I think, again, uh, the, the stats indicate, slightly better against left-handers, and that's why uh, he's playing game four against Ford. Um, but to combined, Haller and Bailey hit 35 homers in 1962 <laughs> and drove in 100 runs. So they, they did a great job of, of using that platoon of two left-handed hit catchers. 2-0 lead. The Yankees tied it in the sixth off Bob Bolin, a relief pitcher. And the reason Bolin is in the game is earlier in the fifth inning, Marichal, who was pitching brilliantly, tried to sacrifice Bunt. The pitch came in and hit him on his index finger. Um, he, he would later tell Dark, I can't throw anymore. And he, he left the game. Giants had to go to their bullpen. So Bolin gives up two runs. The game is tied uh, in the seventh, seventh inning, 2-2 game. The Giants used three pinch hitters, a pinch runner, and the Yankees used two relievers to set the stage of bases loaded and one out um, for Chuck Hiller, the second baseman. One quick note that I thought was interesting, one of the base runners – 
um, was it was Bob Nyman, who came up with the St. Louis Browns, hit two home runs in the very first game he ever played. Uh, at this point, is in his last season in baseball, playing for the Giants. He's like the sixth outfielder on the team. Uh, his only World Series appearance is in Game 4. He went up as a pinch hitter, drew an intentional walk, ran down to first base, was lifted for a pinch runner. So his entire contribution to the series was pinch hitter, intentional walk, taken out for a pinch runner. But anyway, the bases are loaded in the seventh. Hiller's up. The Yankees bring in Marshall Bridges, who was a left-handed reliever, maybe their best reliever during the regular season. But he struggled toward the end of the season, and he wasn't very effective in this series. Hiller hits a grand slam home run to make it 6-2. to two. It's the first National League Grand Slam and World Series play. And, and thinking about it over the, <laughs> the past few weeks, other than the Freddie Freeman Grand Slam we just saw against the Yankees in the, this year's World Series, you could make a pretty good argument that Hiller's Grand Slam might have been the most famous one, I think, in, in World Series play. And maybe overall, I, I don't, I'm not aware, maybe you can correct me, but I'm not aware of a Grand Slam that won a pennant or won a World Series. Um, so Hiller's, Hiller's hit was pretty significant at the time. And again, if you look at the World Series film, you see tons of fans celebrating the, the Giants taking a 6-2 to two lead. They add an unearned run in the ninth on a Bobby Richardson error. The Yanks get one back in the ninth. But uh, Dark, in, in trying to square the World Series, brought in Billy O'Dell, who was typically a starting pitcher, but he brought him in to pitch the final three innings to lock it down, which he did. Um, this removed O'Dell as a possible starter in game five. So with the series tied 2-2, uh, the next day it rains in New York. They're in the dugouts. Commissioner Ford Frick consistently tries to keep everybody uh, optimistic. He says, hey, it's not raining in uh, Newark where they're getting their weather reports, but it's raining in the Bronx. And eventually after an hour or so delay, they cancel, postpone game five. It's played the next day, um, and it's it's Sanford against Terry again. Um, the Jose Pagan, who was the Giants' best hitter throughout this World Series, hits a home run in the fifth inning and gives the Giants a two to one lead. Uh, the Yankees get their two runs; they eventually tie it. Both their runs scored one on a wild pitch, one on a pass ball. Um, Defense was going to be a concern for the Giants in this series, as we'll sum up a little later. Um, so the the game is tied again, two to two, a very familiar score in this series. Um, in the sixth inning, when the Yankees tie it, we go to the bottom of the eighth, and it's still two two. Sanford is still pitching. Uh, there's a little activity in the Giants bullpen, but but Dark has a commitment with Sanford. He trusts him. Um, the Yankees put two men on base and Tom Tresh comes to bat, switch hitter, batting left-handed. He hits one into the right field seats. Um, the cover of, uh, my book is, is this shot of Matty Alou going back to the seats, but the ball is clearly well above him. And, uh, that was Tresh's home run. The Giants get one back in the top of the ninth, um, and they have the tying run at the plate in Bailey, who they call on to pinch hit, but uh, he flies out, and the Yankees win game six, five to two, and, uh, excuse me, five to three, and uh, I think I've misplaced my notes. That, Yeah, that's, it, it was actually five to three. I was right the first time. Uh, one other note that I, I should have mentioned with regard to the previous game four, the Giants, the Haller-Hiller game, um, the winning pitcher in that game, uh, I don't know if anybody knows, but it was Don Larson, 
Um, and it was exactly six years to the day that he had thrown his perfect game against the Dodgers in the same stadium. Thought that was an interesting note. So the teams head to the West Coast uh, with the Yankees holding a 3-2 to two lead in the series. And then we get Typhoon Frida, or as many people on the West Coast refer to it, even to this day, the Columbus Day storm, because it occurred over the Columbus Day weekend. But the, the this was a storm that produced 46 deaths along the Pacific Northwest in California, Oregon, Washington, even as far north as Vancouver and British Columbia. Um, there was a meteorologist who declared that this storm was actually stronger and more destructive than the one depicted in the movie The Perfect Storm with George Clooney in 2000. There was no way the teams were going to play the first two days. It was blustery, it was raining. Um, on the third day, which would have been Sunday, October 14th, this would have been the fourth day that the series was uh, on hiatus. Um, the sun was out, but the field was so wet that uh, Matty Schwab, who was the, the head groundskeeper and had been the Giants groundskeeper for many, many years at the Polo Grounds, he determined that there was no way they could play, but they would try and play the following day, Monday. Um, now, the teams had been off for four days when, when Sunday's game was declared postponed again. And at this point, the Yankees were extremely restless. I mean, they were stuck in a hotel. that They were staying at a hotel owned by their owner, half-owner, uh, Del Webb, had a uh, owning propriety in the town townhouse hotel in San Francisco. That's where the Yankees were headquartered, but they were going stir crazy. You read about them and they were, they were playing endless games of poker and cards, you know, watching TV, maybe walking to a movie theater. Um, but they were getting restless. The Giants at least were in their homes and apartments in San Francisco, but I'm sure they were looking to have some activity as well. Alvin Dark tried to rent the Cow Palace um, to see if they could take batting practice in there, but there was a hockey game the night he tried to reach it. Uh, finally, the two teams uh, with, with help from the commissioner's office found that there was a minor league ballpark in Modesto, California, about two hours away to the north. Modesto had only gotten about a couple of inches of rain uh, during this storm. So the Yankees and the Giants both got on buses and, and drove up. The Yankees went first, took about an hour's uh, worth of batting practice. The pitchers got to throw a little bit. They at least loosened their arms. Whitey Ford was quoted as saying, I never thought I'd be happy to have a two-hour bus ride, but he was, just to get out of the hotel. Uh, so both teams worked out that, that last day uh, with the series scheduled to resume on Monday, October 15th. The matchups were gonna be Ford versus Pierce. And there's one thing I should mention here that I think worked to the Giants detriment, which was the postponements. If there had not been a postponement from Typhoon Frida, um, I doubt Ralph Terry would have thrown game seven on two days rest. I don't know that, but it's doubtful. Um, Stafford has, was later uh, quoted in another book that I researched saying he did not think there was any way he could pitch with the bruised shin he had because that was his landing leg um, as a right-hander. So that meant if there hadn't been a postponement for three days, Hauk would have had to thrown in some combination either Jim Bounton or Roland Sheldon, who were pretty much spot starters during the year, and Whitey Ford. Whitey Ford threw a nice game in the first game of the series, but the Giants hit him pretty good uh, subsequently, and they would in this game as well. So the Yankees would have been either throwing Ford in game six, as they did, and then Bounton or Sheldon instead of Terry on rest. Um, but that's, that's I think, overlooked, and, and it didn't work to the Giants' advantage. The Giants lost Marischal for the rest of the series, but they had still had Pierce, Sanford, and they could have started Odell. 
um, without the postponements. So game six is pretty much Billy Pierce and uh, the return, so to speak, of Orlando Cepeda, who had gone 0 for 12 in the series before that, uh, went 0 for 4 in game one against Ford um, and struck out and hit into a double play in key moments when the Giants had runners on base. But in this game, Cepeda goes three for four, drives in two runs. Uh, Felipe Alou and Hiller both get two hits. They out hit the Yankees 10 to three. Um, Pierce had had some fairly good success against the Yankees as a member of the Chicago White Sox. Um, and so he, he winds up being the hero of game six. Uh, the Giants win it five to two and the series is tied three, three. Despite the fact that Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris and Elston Howard and Bill Scourin are in terrible slumps and not hitting over 200, how comes out and says, I'm not making any changes to the lineup. He was, he was one of those guys that said, these are my starters. I'm going the distance with them. Um, it was going to be Ralph Terry and Jack Sanford for the third straight time in the series. This is the first time since 1945 that the same two pitchers uh, went against each other for three times in a World Series. Um, for you trivia fans, the, the last time it happened was Hal Newhauser for the Tigers and Hank Borowie for the Cubs in 1945. Sanford entering this game was 23 and two at Candlestick in 1961 and 62. Um, and of course, Terry had, had still was over trying to overcome 1960 where he threw the infamous ninth inning home run ball to Bill Mazeroski for the Pirates to win that game. So game seven is scoreless uh, until the fifth inning when the Yankees come up in the top of the fifth and they get singles by Scourin and Boyer. And then Sanford makes a bad mistake. He walks Ralph Terry, the pitcher, on four pitches. So you've got the bases loaded and nobody out. The Giants infield plays back in double play depth. Uh, you know, the classic second guess that, that some writers came up with later on was, why didn't he bring the infield in? Uh, he said, I'm not doing that because it, it might lead to a big inning. Uh, I've got confidence in my team. So he plays back. Tony Kubek is the batter. He hits a two or three hopper to Pagan, who throws to Hiller, and they turn the double play. Scourin scores, and it's one nothing Yankees. Uh they get the third out, and that's the, the limit of the damage in that inning. Uh, in the San Francisco seventh inning, with one out, Mays hits a tremendous shot down the left field line. And Tresh, playing left field, makes a tremendous running catch, uh, what you would call a snow cone catch, where the ball is, is clearly visible in his glove. It's a famous picture that we've all seen probably if you've done any research at all on the 1962 World Series. But Tresh makes the catch, and Mays later is quoted in the locker room as saying, I don't know what that kid was doing playing over there. Everybody in the National League knows I hit the ball to left center, not down the line. But he did this time, and Tresh made a great catch. And that becomes important because McCovey, who's on deck, hits a, a fly ball over Mantle's head for a triple. Uh, but the, the Cepeda strikes out, and the inning goes by the boards. So fast forward to the ninth inning. Odell had come on in relief with the Yankees having the bases loaded and nobody out in the eighth, but he gets out of it through a double play ball and a strikeout. Um, in the ninth, a very famous inning, um, Matty Alou comes up as a pinch hitter and leads off with a bunt single. Um, Hiller tries to sacrifice him over, but he, he fouls off the first two bunt attempts and then strikes out. Felipe Alou tries to bunt on the first pitch from Terry, he fouls it off. But then he, he goes back to trying to hit and he strikes out. So Matty Alou's on first, two out. Mays is the batter against Terry. He hits a rope down the right field line uh, and Maris manages to, to track it down 
on the soggy field because it's rained for several days, obviously. The ball doesn't scoot to the wall, and Maris gets it and makes a perfect strike to Richardson, the relay man. And now you've got you've got two controversial decisions on two batters. And here's the first one. Whitey Lockman is the, the Giants' third base coach. He's watching intently. He later said, if Maris had bobbled the ball at all, I was sending a loo. But Maris fielded it cleanly, hit the cutoff man. Lockman throws up the stop sign. Matty Alou stays there. Matty Alou later said he thought he would be out at the plate. Elston Howard said, I was hoping he'd come because the game would have ended a few minutes earlier. We'd have had him. Um, if you watch the film, Maris's throw to Richardson is a good one, but Richardson's throw home takes a, a kangaroo hop. It doesn't go over Howard's head, but he's got to reach up to catch it. Um, and so, you know, the conjecture, would Alou have scored? You know, is, is, who knows? The only voice I could find that said they should have sent him, because even Alvin Dark thought his third base coach made the right decision. But Willie Mays, as you might expect, said, if I was that runner, I'd have gone. I would have made them throw me out. Uh, we weren't having any success against this pitcher. I would have tried it. They don't try it. Alou's on third. Mays is on second. How comes out to talk to Terry? What do you want to do? Do you want to pitch to McCovey with first base open? Do you want to walk him and pitch to Cepeda, who's on, who's on deck? Terry decides for a variety of reasons he'd rather pitch to McCovey. He had seen McCovey more, even though McCovey had the long triple on him earlier in the game. He hadn't pitched to Cepeda as much. Um, he didn't want to be in a situation where if he fell behind in the count, he was going to have to groove one to, to Cepeda. So he pitches to McCovey. First pitch is a curveball that McCovey hits fairly well, but off the end of the bat, it looks like it might be the end of the game. Fly ball to right field. Maris is trying to get under it, but the wind and candlestick blows it foul. So it's strike one. McCovey takes ball one after that. Then Terry decides, look, I'm, I'm going to throw my best stuff and try and jam him. He didn't get the ball quite inside enough. McCovey opens up his hips, hits a rope. Obviously, we've all seen it, heard about it. A liner that Richardson takes once crossover step, catches, and the series is over. Richardson was quoted in his biography, his autobiography, as saying, you know, people have said I made a leaping catch. I took two steps to my left. He said, I didn't have time for any of that. The ball caught me. I was lucky to catch it. You know, a couple of feet to any other side, and we lose the series. In the aftermath, uh, you know, I've wondered why this series doesn't get so much attention. Um, and I think there are several reasons. The big guns in the series just did not hit. Mickey Mantle hit 120, didn't drive in a single run. Roger Maris hit 174. Elston Howard hit 143. Mays hit 250, but he only drove in one run. Uh, McCovey hit 200. Cepeda uh, hit 158. Um, there were not a lot of runs scored. You know, most people would rather see a lot of runs scored in a, in a championship deciding game seven. This was one nothing, the first one nothing game seven in World Series history. You have to go back to 1922, excuse me, 1921, which was Giants. Yankees in the polo grounds exclusively for a one nothing deciding game. That was game eight. Uh, that year, the World Series was a best of nine. And in 1991, of course, Jack Morris uh, threw a one nothing shutout for the Twins over the Braves. But this was the first one nothing game seven. I think the media, and this is just my opinion, I think the media and casual sports fans were getting tired of the Yankees being in the World Series as much as they had been. And I think maybe they wanted the Dodgers as the other team. I think there was a lot of attention about Maury Wills uh, breaking the stolen base record that year. New stadium at uh, Dodger Stadium was brand spanking new. Candlestick by 62 was already being criticized by, by all kinds of people. Uh, so that could have been part of it. Maybe they didn't like the matchup. I think the rain, the postponements, one postponement in New York, 
And then three postponements in San Francisco, I think that killed the momentum for this series. You only had one game played on a weekend, on a Saturday or Sunday, out of all seven. Um, and, of course, we weren't playing games in prime time back then. The game started uh, at 3 o'clock New York time on the East Coast, the games in San Francisco. Um, I think if McCovey had gotten a hit in that last at-bat, I think the series would be a lot more celebrated. I think if he'd gotten a game-winning hit, uh, there'd be a lot more attention paid to the 62 series. And then the last factor, which could enter into it, world events. Uh, while the series was beginning, you had all the civil rights movement in Mississippi where uh, James Meredith was trying to enter the University of Mississippi and there were riots and the president was sending troops down there. And then right after the series, uh, within a week, you had the Cuban Missile Crisis, John F. Kennedy getting on television, talking about the missiles spotted in Cuba, the Russian missiles. And we all know about the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I think that deterred follow-up attention to the series. Um, one other last piece of uh, aftermath, if I could, and that was uh, involved this fella right here, which I hope you all can see. Um, a couple of days after the Game 7, Charles Schultz, who wrote Peanuts, uh, did a strip in which Charlie Brown and his buddy Linus for three panels sit with their heads in their hands, not saying a word. And then in the fourth panel, Charlie Brown raises up his arms and screams, why couldn't McCovey have hit the ball three feet higher? Uh, so I will stop at this point. I hope I haven't gone too long and bored you. But I'm looking forward to your comments, questions, and we'll try and do our best. John, that was really informative, and uh, a lot of the people in here will relate to what you said. Uh, first of all, the book. Best way to get the book. Yeah, the best way to get the book is either um, Barnes & Noble, uh, Amazon, or you can go directly from the publisher, McFarland & Company. Wonderful. They do a lot of uh, baseball uh, history books. Terrific. I got two quick questions, and you just showed us uh, Charlie Brown. Did that um, lead you to think about writing this? No, I, as I said, I, I've 1962 was when I fell in love with baseball, and I've always been of the opinion that this World Series should have been given a lot more attention than it has historically. If it was played today... I think Twitter or X or whatever, Instagram would explode with people saying, why did, they, why did Hauk leave Ford in there? Why did they try and bunt there? Uh, why didn't he send Matty Alou? Things like that. And so as I tried to find uh, literature on this series, I couldn't find enough. And I said, well, I've always wanted to write a baseball book. This is the subject matter I ought to try. Yeah, you mentioned social media. I mean especially in today's society, regardless of Terry getting McCovey out, you know that that would have been, oh, uh, that he question. wasn't walked because, uh, you know, you can't have a righty facing a lefty. So Right, right. Anyway, we got a lot of uh, people here who want to ask questions. A lot of them are from San Francisco. I'm going to start with Mars. Uh, well, that was uh, brought back a lot of memories. Thank you for that. Um, I, I, watching that game, I thought that Matty Alou would have probably been out. But as Willie Mays always said, he would have ran through Whitey Lockman's uh, signs and bowled over Elston Howard. And in those days, you could crash into the couch, uh, into the catcher without uh, any penalty. And watching that throw take a hop and bounce up high, I think Mays, you know, had he been the runner, would have uh, taken him powered out. I also think that because Marischal being hit on the finger trying to bunt, if he was able to uh, stay in the World Series, would have been a larger impact. Um, and, um, and then um, 
you know, like I would have played the infield in second guessing Alvin Dark with such a close game and being that uh, it was a pitcher's world series for the most part. I, w I would have played the infield in. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with, with both the things you said. I think, I think if, if a particularly Mays, who was in a very aggressive and skilled base runner, if he'd have been coming around third, I think there's a very good shot. He scores based on what the throw wound up being. Um, with regard to the where they played the infield, you know, you had Kubek and Richardson coming up, um, not big hitters. I, I would have tried it, and, and uh, you know, I, I, Alvin Dark had his reasons for doing it, and they only gave up one run. With regard to Marichal, you can't fault the game Jack Sanford pitched or the one Pierce pitched in game six. So um, I'm sure they would have loved to have Marichal ready, but uh, uh, pitching wasn't the Giants' problem in the last two games. Thank you. Thank you, Mars. All right, Howard uh, Williams, you're up. Unmute, Howard. Hey, um, yeah. So uh, Mays was asked um, uh, after the game, uh, Mays was asked, uh, a reporter said, uh, McCovey hit that ball pretty hard. It probably would have been uh, fielded by Maris, who was, as we know, a great uh, fielding outfielder. And Mays was asked, uh, he hit that ball pretty hard uh, so that Maris would have had a chance to make a close play uh, at the plate. And uh, Mays responded, he said, uh, I would have been in the dugout by the time the ball got to uh, – <laughs> To, um, to to Elston Howard. Um, now, Mays exaggerated, but we get his point. I think he would have beaten any throw from the outfield. You got to remember that the outfield was extremely wet and soggy, so that ball would have would have died a little bit going out to right field, even as hard as McCovey hit it. And so I agree with you. There's no way I don't think they would have thrown Maris or thrown Mays out at the plate. Yeah. Uh, my question is, um, now the year before, uh, bringing a little personal stuff here, uh, the year before we lived in Ohio, and uh, my dad took me to the uh, third game of the uh, World Series uh, between the Reds and the Yankees, uh, and I remember Yogi Berra tying the game, I think in the eighth inning or a late inning. Uh, so tying the game two to two and Maris hit uh, the um, game winning home run uh, to make it three to two. And that put the Yankees up two to one and they just went on to take the next two games. Um, so Yogi Berra, Yogi Berra and uh, Maris had hit clutch home runs in late in that third game. So that the series, that series was closer than it looks. Um so you mentioned the other players, but uh, I can't really remember. Did Yogi Bear do anything significant in the 62 series? He, he started one game. Uh, Howard uh, got bruised up in game one. Um, the only game that the, that Hauk made any substitutions in his there, line it was uh, game two. Yeah, it he had uh, Barra as the catcher and Dale Long played first base instead of scouring. But Yogi didn't get a hit that day, um, didn't really do much uh, in that game. Thank you, Howard. Ken Hogarty, you're up. Thank you. I enjoyed your presentation. I actually attended game six, and uh, it's a fond memory. Obviously, they won that day. And I was a freshman in high school. I remember playing hooky after with all the rain, you know, had about notes every day. I thought the game was going to be played on Friday and so notes then and finally got out on Monday and went to the game with my dad, who, even though he's a warehouseman and didn't make a lot of money, somehow had gotten tickets to the game and things like that. So great game. Saw Pierce pitch, was sure then we were going to win the next day. And um, as it turned out, I watched the seventh game on a little TV with about 80 students in a class next to 
the main office and things like that. And we were all going crazy with the antennas up in the time on the TVs and things like that, obviously in the last inning and things like that. But I did think at the time that, my God, they're so good. We're going to be back next year. We're going to win a World Series in a year or two. And it was 52 years later when I was principal of that same high school that I got to dismiss a student body for a World Series victory parade. But mm -hmm. I thought I was going to get it that year, but not quite the case. You mentioned the, the idea of <clears throat> Mays maybe scoring. And the vivid memory I have at that time was the next couple of weeks because it was during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And we were under the desks at times doing the practice drills and stuff like that. And I remember, I think, a lot of time under the desk thinking about McCovey's line drive, but then also the point about Mays. And this was like 35 years before Dolly the Sheep was cloned, but I always thought if Mays had been cloned, and the old saying about a lot of times that Russ and Lon would talk about that uh, the only person who could have caught that ball hit the ball. And I always felt that the person who could have scored on that ball was the one who hit it, unfortunately. But if there had been two Mazes, and there was a maze at second. I could have pictured him bowling over Howard at the plate. I don't remember the throw, but I think in any case, he would have been aggressive enough to try and score. So that's always a great memory. But to me, the thing, you know, when you mentioned about the his history of it, I agree. It was an incredible series and everything. And two years after the Mazeroski winning in the, the sixth game, maybe that took away a little bit from it because there had been that drama. So it was almost like something people were used to. But I think the Cuban Missile Crisis did play a lot into that, that immediately thereafter, everybody was sort of diverted. And as I look back at from from this vantage point all these years later, I'm not sure which was, you know, you know, it almost seemed like the end of the world to me when the Giants lost, yet alone with what I was worried about with the Cuban Missile Crisis. So uh, the whole year, though, was so interesting with the Dodger Giant pennants. I remember going to the airport after they, they won in L.A., 50,000 people at the airport. Yes. And my buddy and I uh, came up to Lon Simmons and asked Lon how we were going to do in a series. And he had clearly been had a few at that point. And his comment was, we're going to win hands down. And I was so disappointed we didn't. So I thank you for your presentation. I don't really have a question, but but it was wonderful going back over those memories and listening to you talk. So thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you Ken. Howard Manis, you're up. Unmute, Howard. Howard, you muted. Here we go. Sorry about that. Oh, good presentation, John. I imagine you're familiar with this book. Um, yes. About the 62 pound race. Yes, sir. I read this about 20 years ago. So I'm looking forward now to uh, taking a look at your book because you actually go beyond the pennant race. I think there's a small chapter on the back of this about the World Series, but your book is more exclusively, I would say, on the really focused on the pennant race. I'm on the World Series. I'm not being correct about that, but uh, then I just want to make a couple of comments. Uh, when the '62 World Series was going on, I lived in the Bronx, in uh, the section of the Bronx called High Bridge, six blocks of Yankee Stadium, just six blocks, a ten-minute walk, and we were all Giant fans. I'm talking about the adults, but the kids too. I was not an adult. I was nine years old in, in second grade, I think, except for one guy that I knew. We were all Giant fans left over from the New York Giants. They carried, you know, they loved Mays. They loved the, the new breed of Giants who started in, in San Francisco. We were just within walking distance of the polo ground as well. So when the Giants came to play uh, the Mets, we were there. And I'm sure Dodger fans went to see uh, the former Brooklyn team playing the Mets. So we all talked about the Giants, everybody. And, yeah, there was a big crushing blow to that neighborhood uh, after that, seven, I cried. I actually cried. I was nine years old. I was in tears, uh, especially because I was getting jeered by my one Yankee fan. Um, I was. I have a quick question. What was the date of Game Seven? Uh, game Seven uh, was uh, October sixteenth. Okay, because I know I, I remember watching JFK's speech to the nation, and I think that was October twenty second. That's that's exactly right. Yes, and I, on a black and white TV that you know with my parents and we were all wondering is the world coming to an end. Yeah. Um, one more thing I want to point out a little bit of a historical oddity regarding two of the participants in the World Series, one Giant, one Yankee. Both uh, Ralph Terry and uh, Jack Sanford were golf pros later uh, after they retired. Now. Stanford happened to be uh, the, the pro at the golf course on the day that Gil Hodges dropped dead at that golf course. Oh. He was one of the ones who was, they called, get help, get help. 
and it was Sanford who got the uh, EMT, the ambulances. And uh, I don't know how that affected later on, but of course, you know, by then I was in college, you know, I remember how crushed I was. Uh, and it happened right after they had played 18. In fact, I think they went beyond 18 holes because Hodges was feeling great. He was with his Met coaches and baseball was on strike. Then you might recall there was a strike early in the 72 season. So uh, Sanford, unfortunately, uh, that was his course that uh, Hodges uh, collapsed and died. Now, Ralph Terry also became a golf pro, as you might know. And I went to uh, a memorabilia show, and I don't remember if it was the 1990s or early 2000s. And he was there, and I met him. I shook his hand, and I said, you know, Ralph, you know, you broke my heart in 62. He felt so bad for me that he gave me a free autograph on a golf ball. I didn't have to pay for it. I still have it upstairs somewhere. And he was very nice. He said, you know, I hope you're over it by now. And I said, yeah, it's been about 30 years. I'm over it. But I really mm. wanted to kill you that day, mm. uh, as well as Richardson for making that catch. And of course, I was subject to all those rumors, too, that he moved to the left, he moved to the right. Moved. I've seen the replays now a dozen times. He just stood there like a statue and it went right to him. So it's kind of uh, ironic that both of the two players, participants in the series, both pitchers, uh, and they played in those last two games in San Francisco, uh, respectively, ended up in the same profession afterwards. So uh, 62 means a lot to me. It was a, you know, and then I had to wait, of course, until 2010, until the Giants finally won something. Uh, but by then I was a Met fan. So whatever. So thanks Thank for the presentation. You. I really enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you, you, Howard. Mr. Weinberg. John, that was a great presentation. Uh, I agree with Mars. It brought back a lot of memories. Um, I was a freshman at CCNY, which was a commuter school. It's still a commuter school. I lived in the Northeast Bronx with my dad and my uh, my brother and sister. My mom had passed away a couple of years before. Um, it was my first year at City College. I was spending more time at school than than in the apartment. But that seventh game, I took the bus and the subway, and I went home to watch the game. And when Willie Mack hit that line drive, I leaped into the air in my dad's living room, which was hardwood floor, and I came down and landed on my knees. They still hurt. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, October 8th, when Chuck Hiller hit the Grand Slam home run, I actually had been offered a ticket to the game. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm Jewish, but I'm not really religious. But that happened to have occurred on Yom Kippur, which is the holiest day on the Jewish calendar. So I didn't go to the game because, in addition to being a little, keeping an eye on what God was doing those days, I, I was superstitious. I figured if I went to that game, the Giants would lose. And of course, Chuck Hill hit the home, hit the Grand Slam, and the Giants won. Um, so I figured I had a hand in that, in that a little bit, not going to the game. I also remember a, a little, I don't know what it is, but there was a, um, I don't know what it's called. You teachers out there can help me, Gary, but do you remember something that they say you could holler about Hiller and Haller, but you can't Buffalo Duffalo? Does anybody remember that? God, oh Giants had a pitcher named Hiller Jim Duffalo. I, yes, I heard that, but... yes. Miller, well, that, 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 Stu Miller. Huh? It was Hiller Haller Miller. Yeah, Jenny. You could, Jenny. Holler, you could holler about Hiller and Haller, but you can't Buffalo Duffalo. Anyway, I'll Google that later and we'll turn There's it There's a up. place in Oracle <laughs> Park, like next to, God, it's <clears> next to the media area, and it's like has the whole Hiller Haller. Hallelujah twist. Yeah, that's that it. was a that's recording it. by that's Danny it. Kay. Danny yes. Kay did that recording down in LA and they were playing it all summer and things like that. And it was, you know, the Hiller Haller Hallelujah twist. And I think the Buffalo right. Buffalo line was in there somewhere too. Hmm. But you can look that okay. up. And 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 the, the last comment I'm I'm gonna make, I got a bunch of others, but I'm gonna make one more. The first time I attended a game at the you should excuse the expression, the new Yankee Stadium. I walked around, I was taking photographs, and the Yankees have, and I, I don't know what the right adjective is that would make me not throw up, but they have enlargements of photographs from all their World Series victories. 
And I just happen to go up to the second deck and I emerge and there is the picture of commemorating the 62 Yankee win over my Giants. Um, so I stayed away from that area of Yankee <laughs> Stadium. Um, anyway, it, 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 it was a, a troublesome World Series, it, but, it, but as anything else in baseball, it brings back good memories. That was trouble time. I remember JFK's speech to the nation. Um, um, but thank you very much for bringing all those memories back to us, John. Thank you, Harvey. Mr. Clink. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, and thank you very much, John. Uh, I, I have to say, this is always one of the great uh, travels down memory lane for me. I was 13 years old. Uh, it was, you know, in spite of the loss, probably my favorite Giants baseball season. I did want to clarify one thing about the Cuban Missile Crisis. And this is an excellent book. It's called 13 Days by Robert yeah, Kennedy. Read it. And yeah, and, and he does state, actually, it was on Tuesday morning, October 16th that uh, he received a call uh, from President Kennedy alerting him about the the the, the, uh, the uh, missiles in Cuba. So, you know, there really wasn't anything on the radar leading up to this. And, and by the time this made any kind of an impact, the World Series was right. over at that point. Uh, I, I thought it might have been during a, a coincidental period. The other thing is about a couple of other things. Al Dark did a very important thing in setting up the uh, playoff games. He kept back a very good left-hander, we all know, Billy O'Dell, on complete four-day rest because he knew he wasn't going to get the benefit of a day off. So he had an extremely well-rested uh, pitcher, O'Dell, to go in uh, game one. And, of course, O'Dell was, of course, like uh, Pierce, a lefty. And lefties typically shined at candlestick because that meant they faced the right-handed hitters who had tough times hitting into the wind. Ask any right-handed hitter at candlestick about that over the years. But, you know, that's just that. I did want to ask you too, uh, you know, I know, I don't want to beat this horse, but I got to, I, I got to resurrect it for a moment. And that is the play, the decision to play the infield back. You know, Jerry Holtzman in the issue in Baseball Digest right after the World Series, you know, wrote a scathing article about, you know, second guessing this. But here's the thing to set it up. And, and this is where I don't understand what Dark or anyone was thinking. He had Skyron, the slowest of all the of all of the Yankees on third base. Right. And, and you said it's a two hopper to Pagan. You know, I, I don't know why he didn't say, man, if this thing is a poked it right at you, if it's a slow roller, man, you got to go double play or, you know, force that double play, maybe. But man, it was if it's a two hopper to him, I can't understand why he didn't go home in that. But, you know, it, it, I, I'm considering, you know, if it had been a really fast runner, you know, if it had been, you know, uh, 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 a, a Maris or a, a, a male who had had better speed, you know, I can see you're not going to get them. But um uh, uh, I, I had to relate to you that in games um, four, uh, game four, when he hit the grand slam and game s seven, I was in rooms at Wilbur Junior High School that were sitting right next to each other. And it was like the high and the low. Mm. It was it was a case. I, I was about I, I know when the ball was hit because it was just before four o'clock on the east coast because it was just before one o'clock on the east on the west coast when maris hit it we were allowed to bring transistor radios to school as long as we didn't play them in class so i had it up to my ear and just as i'm going to go into german class that day with mr allen you know and i i forgot whatever german i was going to learn that day when how <laughs> when hiller hit that one out and that that that's in my memory Game seven, I asked Mrs. Jensen, my history teacher, look, I got the radio. She knew I had the radio. I said, how about this? Eighth and ninth innings only, Mrs. Jensen. Can I, I'll keep it on low. I'll put the earplug in. And I reported it to the class, obviously, what, what was going on on that. Hey, 
couple of things you did, I absolutely loved. I, I didn't realize the McCovey situation playing him in right field uh, in game three. That, yes. that, I don't know, you know, there's, there I think is where you could really start second guessing, uh, uh, second guessing dark on that. Cause he was typically the left fielder, not the right fielder. Right. You know, right. why they put him in, I, I know the sun field and all, but geez, I mean, the guy, you know, he, he great hitter, great everything, but it, you know, not going to have the arm for anything on that. And, and you're right about Hiller. Hiller was, you know, Mr. Stonehands. I mean, he, he, he was he was really he was really bad on that. Um, I appreciate it. I Thanks. do have to give a shout out to you that'll mean nothing to anyone else here, but it means something to you. You were the commissioner of my second favorite league, uh, the Southern League, which these guys probably don't know anything about. But the Southern League, um, in their second of the last year, the second of the last year that that, that they were in the Southern League, uh, my alma mater won at Virginia Tech. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, the Hokies love their time in the Southern League. That's still a great conference. Uh, it is. It's a, it's a, it's happened? yeah, it's a it's a good conference. It really is. What made you why did you stay so long there? Um <laughs> I I mean, I I enjoyed the job. I liked the people I was working with. I was there for uh 14 years. Yeah. Um, and uh, my wife is from Greensboro, North oh, okay. Carolina. Oh, I got it. Yeah. We're, we're headquartered. The, the Southern Conference was headquartered in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Right. And, and now two hours away. So it, it worked out. really. That, well. that makes sense because yeah. it, it's it's a great league, but it is kind of a, a smaller league uh, relative yes. to college football on that. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I'm going to buy the book because, you know, I have read uh, Chasing October. But I definitely want to read this one. Anything on the 62 series. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thanks, uh, thank you. I hope you enjoy it. Charles, you're up, Charles. Yeah. Um, great presentation. I um, was not even in my father's eye in 62. It came three years later. Uh, one of the things I don't know if you're aware of, but during the 1981 strike, KMBR, which is a Giants radio station, was rebroadcasting old World Series games. And they broadcasted Game 7 of the 62 series. And I listened to it, rapt attention, and it got all the way to the last inning. And they had, they played it, and it was like McCovey's ball got past Bobby Richardson, right. and the two runs scored. And then they said, well, we know that's not how it happened, and here's how it really happened. But it was so much fun listening to that, where May scored and Alou scored, and it was just, yeah. you know. So exciting. That's great. McCuffey was later quoted in the in the locker room as saying he knew he hit the ball hard, but he didn't even have time to get excited. I yeah. mean, he took one step out of the batter's box and it was over. Yeah. He was my favorite player. I absolutely loved watching him. And I saw him at the end of his career, and he wasn't – I know he wasn't as good as, you know, in the middle or, you know, but I just, I just loved him, and I thought he was just such a class guy. Absolutely. Anyway, I just want, I didn't know if you were aware that KMBR back in 81 during the strike had rebroadcast that. I, I believe I had heard that, yes. That, that would have been interesting to hear, yeah. That's a great start. Uh, Lee, what's up? Uh, really great presentation. Uh, so many things come to mind. Quickly, is it true that McCovey met Richardson 30 years later and his first words to Richardson were, uh, is your hand... Uh, has your hand recovered yet? Or is that that's true? They they had a reunion uh, of the two teams uh, out at I think it was Pac Bell was the name of the stadium at that time, and that's that's true. McCovey asked Richardson, "Does your hand still hurt?" or something words to that effect, and Richardson laughed and said, "You hit it hard, my friend." Something like that. They also asked McCovey. A reporter asked him. Uh, I think someone mentioned they were there when he was inducted into Cooperstown. Um, and they asked McCovey, someone asked him afterwards, what would you like to be remembered for? And he said, I'd like to be remembered as the guy who hit the ball over Bobby Richardson's head. <laughs> I was also wondering that point about Kubek missed most of the season until August. Were there other players on either team that were in that situation? Not that season. I mean, that, that was a time where a lot of players had, had Army obligations. 
<clears throat> but Kubek was the only significant player that missed most of the season because of that. Thank you, Lee. Paul, you're up. Yeah, John, that that was really just wonderful. Um, as I was listening to your story, telling you, telling us about each game and the innings, I kept saying, "Okay, they're going to win. They're going to win." You know, <laughs> it brought me back to the point that I wanted to change history, which is really for people like, for example, Howard is, and I um, were born. We're both nine years old when this was going on. So this meant everything. To us, even though I lived in Massachusetts, I was a Willie Mays fan. It was just really wonderful. Um, and, and and then I, I had one thing. I had a. I actually still have my father's program. My father went to the World Series, and I'm still asking myself. Unfortunately, my father has passed, but I'm saying because he knew how much I love Willie Mays, and I'm like, Dad, why didn't you take me? You know. But I don't, and I don't have an answer to that question. But I did have a question about Maddie about Maddie Alou. How many bases did he steal in 62 to give us an indication of whether he could have beaten that throw? Uh, I've got an encyclopedia here, but it doesn't have stolen bases. Let me let me find his. I don't I don't have that right on hand, but I'll find it and get it to you. Uh, maybe I'm well, just curious see. because my sense was that he was a pretty quick runner. You know, if I'm not mistaken, right? Alou was really good at really good speed. Felipe, not as much. He stole you know, three, Matt, three bases. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Shit, I'm glad he stayed on base. Okay. <laughs> he had good right, he thanks. had as good good a speed though as anybody on the team other than Mays. Yeah. Okay. All right, John. Thank you so much. Either, so. You know, I want to make a couple of comments that I was gonna ask. Ken Hogarty, you know, when you mentioned that they lost and you thought it was gonna be a year year, you know, year by year. I was going to ask the people in San Francisco, I mean, who would have ever thought you had to wait till 2010? That was one thing. And then either Ted or Harvey, five minutes. you know, you followed them in New York. They play in San Francisco and the whole coaching staff is all made up of former uh, New York Giants. I, I wonder if that made you feel, you know, closer to the team, even though they were so far away. Harvey, do you? Any idea? You remember? You're on mute. I'm on you? mute, Gary. Yeah. Um, you saying because the coaching staff had all yeah, been New York? All, yeah, they had a lot of New York Giants oh, and some of the players man. as well. And to I me, thought to me the the connection was and re still remains Willie Mays. Willie Mays. Okay. And Charles, uh, finally. Uh, that story that you told was great. I, I never knew that existed. I would have loved to hear that. So, I think somewhere I may or may not have it because I was like, actually, actually went to my first concert, which was at the Oakland Coliseum, and it was a day on the green show with Bill, you know, Bill Graham and a bunch of con a bunch of bands, and and I'm there, and I smuggled in my tape deck. I put it under my coat and walked in with it, and I'm there, and I'm like flipping tapes back and forth. And people are like, are you recording the show? And I'm like, no, the Giants came and they're looking at me like <laughs> I'm nuts. But, but, you know, it was like I had hopes for 89 until the earthquake and yeah. playing the A's in 2002. I thought, you know, we had that locked up in the bag and, you know. 87. 87. Yeah. 87. They, they're up. The they're up. They, all they got to do is beat the cards one yeah, game. I know. Yep. Yeah. John, just uh, let's all give it up for John. I am Marino. Just fabulous, John. And John, again, yeah. where John. can we get this? It's available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, mm -hmm. or directly from the publisher McFarland & Company. Wonderful. Uh, please don't be a stranger. Uh, and we will uh, reconvene next Thursday with uh, Jerry Eisenberg and Larry Doby. Uh, just a fabulous presentation. John, we salute you. Have a great night, everybody. And uh, My pleasure, John. I'll Thank hang you. around here for a little. If anybody wants to talk some giant baseball, I'm going to stop recording now. Have a great night, everybody. Harvey Weinberg. <laughs>